Maestro Sam Burtis, one of the most uh, deeply respected members of this ensemble. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I have definite hermit tendencies, so I've just embraced them. I'm in the Bronx. I live in a wonderful cave where I can practice 24 hours a day. I'm happy, except for the fact that the rest of the world is going to hell. Do you remember the first time you played with the band? I remember the first rehearsal. I was so shocked at the rhythmic aspects of what was going on. It was mind blowing, it really was. I always said to students, man, if you can find the eighth note, you're cool. You know, whether it's Tito Puente's eighth note or Machito's eighth note, they're different. Same with Bird and Train, but you don't, you're not dealing in eighth notes. <laughs> you're dealing in the 16th notes, and it's a whole nother thing. And you often get the drummer to chop the eighth note in a place where it reorients all the rhythmic things that are going on. You do it on purpose, you drop a bomb, and stuff happens. And it took me, I don't know, three or four rehearsals and several performances before I didn't have to go like <laughs> Lee Konitz's band was all the history of jazz right on back. The same with Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra. And Gil Evans, I pretty much knew what they were doing. And Mingus, I pretty much knew what they were doing. But yours was the first music I ever played except for La Histoire de Soldat, which I had to sight read. I'm sorry, you said sight read? Yeah, yes. You're the next one after that, as far as where is one? But it's always there, you just gotta find it. How do you approach playing in this band? It's more complex rhythmically, it's more complex harmonically, and it's more complex timbrally, especially the trombone sections you put together. And the fact that I'm playing third on, on, the, on the axe that I really like to play best of all my axes, and trying to lock in both to these amazing bass trombone players that you've had, how about James on that recording? He crushed. And lock into the great lead players as well. It's like juggling timbres. I love it. What that middle trombone section person is doing to the sound. You just being there with the sound that you have, which is... Sounds, that's the thing. It's not sound, it's sounds. When I'm blending with one bass trombone player, there's a, there's a brilliance to the sound that I gotta get. With others, you gotta take that off and just sit on top of their sound. And the same way goes in the other direction, too. It's a wonderful challenge. You sit down and the entire horn section just expands in sound. I don't know how you do it. I mean, when you're Sam Burtis, you get to pick your chair. Once in a while, yeah. Is there a particularly challenging spot? Yeah, from the first note to the last. <laughs> yeah, just play this long talk for a while. <laughs> wonderful. Uh oh here it comes. It's the best challenge I've ever had musically in my life. If you go in thinking you're the greatest thing on earth, this music will teach you otherwise very quickly. I never have any of those misconceptions, so it's, it's <laughs> each and every. I wonder if you might be able to reflect on this album as a protest record. I've kind of given up protesting in a sense, which is something I've been doing since I was 18 years old. I, I, I stepped out of the entire culture I grew up in, in protest of what I saw it happening. I was in Vietnam and Cambodia and Thailand with the Buddy Rich Band for three weeks during the height of the war. I went in an innocent, like almost apolitical, all I thought about was, you know, Train and JJ, or Bird. And I came out so disgusted with what I had seen that uh, it changed my whole life in terms of politics. But recently I've begun to understand that evolution continues no matter what kind of Hitler you have to deal with, I'm accepting. But not in a passive way, just like this too shall pass. Do you have anything that you would want to ask me? When's the next gig? That's about the only question I have about the music. I know what it's gonna be, so I know I wanna do it. You know, everything new that comes out in that book is a learning experience. For me too. Yeah, for all of us. That's what's so beautiful about the band. Listen, this band is, uh, it's the next step after Gil and Miles, as far as I'm concerned. And I'm very happy to be a part of it. I got no questions, except uh, how do I play this lick? All I can do is continue to write completely unreasonable shit and give yeah, you- Yeah, please do. Have no mercy. Is there anything that you would want people to know? The level of class in terms of playing and in terms of attitude and in terms of everything in this band is off the charts. There are no assholes in this band, no. except for maybe you sometimes. <laughs> We all, we, all, we all approve of that. I have sort of this, this list of recordings, milestone events in my compositional listening, and you're on most of them, man. The Tom Pearson yeah. track that, that, I, that I've talked to you about. I mean, I, I heard that track and, and completely changed my life. And I look at the credits on that, oh, I'm like, oh, shit, it sounds on there. Epitaph, right? You know, and the early recordings of the Mingus Big Band, which 
you are the music director for. That and, first that first recording was special. Nostalgia of Times Square. Oh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. That was a revelation when I heard it. That was a band of outlaws. Carlo Blay escalator over the hill. There's Virtus again. I stayed on the outside of, of the mainstream, so I was always free to rehearse. Well, it's just what I've been doing since I came to New York when I was 21 years old. After I left Buddy's band, after we had a fist fight, I'm practicing tuba. Funny, you know, I didn't touch it for years. It got heavier. <laughs> I'm so honored to have you playing this music. I'm so honored to play it, man. I don't, I don't think you could uh, be any more honored. I'm really looking forward to making Thanks. some more. Bye, bye, Maestro.